I would always take my computer home with me every day, always took it home with me every day, every weekend. But there was just one day where I turned that corner and I was like, I'm not gonna open that computer when I get home. I'm not gonna open it. And it was so weird from then on, I just couldn't. It was like, I turned that corner and my brain was like, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not working there. And I think it was truly because I was in a stage of real burnout. This is the Beats Working Show. We're on a mission to redeem work, the word, the place, and the way. I'm your host, Mark Wright. Join us because getting paid to practice beats working to get paid. Okay, this is the uh, Sidekick Sessions intro for July, winning at work and at home. And uh, here it comes. Welcome to Sidekick Sessions, where we gather the team at Work P2P and go deep on a topic to create shared learning. This month, how to win at work and at home. This is probably the most universal work topic that we humans deal with. And it seems like the struggle never ends. Too much work can overtake our home life. Too many challenges at home can do the same at work. What we discovered is we all figured this out by making choices based on what we prioritize in life. It's not easy and it's always fluid, but we found knowing who you are and deciding where the lines should be drawn are really the keys to success. To learn more about this topic, be sure to also check out Contributors Corner this month, led by Dr. James Bryant. It's a really great discussion there. All right, here's to winning at work and at home. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome to Sidekick Sessions. This month, we're talking about how to win at work and at home. And along with Contributors Corner, which dropped earlier in the month, we had some great advice from Dr. James Bryant, who is an expert at how to win at work and at home. So that's what we're going to be talking about with the internal team here at Work P2P. I guess we should first start by identifying the team. Tamar, why don't you start? My name's Tamar Medford, and I'm the producer at Work P2P. Elon. Hi, I'm Alon Olson, and I am the creative sidekick. And Libby. I am Libby Sundgren, and I develop content here at Work P2P. Okay, this is going to be, I think, a really interesting conversation because I don't think that there's a more universal struggle than balancing work and life because every human has to do some kind of work and every human has a family. And so I would love to just start out just going around the table here with what your experience has been when it comes to work-life balance. And I know these things can change depending on what phase of our careers we are in. But Alon, I'd love to start with you. What's been your experience with work-life balance so far? Well, I have been with Work P2P for three years. And I mean, we've gone through transitions there in terms of trying to get a work-life balance into place in the way that we talk about it. I will say though, I started my career in customer service and retail and then transitioned into work P2P. So I, I actually don't think I've got a lot of insight on that just because it was either you go to work for your eight hours, you clock in, you clock out, or where I am now. So I I don't feel like I've got a lot of weight behind experience there. Okay. Well, that's fair. But we do work for a company that has a pretty enlightened view when it comes to, we call it oscillation, and that is just downtime to, to recharge. We have an unlimited PTO policy. So I feel like we kind of work for an ideal company when it comes to you know, really embracing the idea of winning at work and at home. So I feel like we're a little bit spoiled that way. Thanks, Alon, for that. Tamar, what about you? What comes to mind when someone says work-life balance? Well, I feel like I've been on a teeter-totter, like a really big teeter-totter for most of my life when it's come to work and life balance. You know, I used to, I come from a corporate uh, background where It was expected that even though they hire you to work 40 hours a week, that's what you got paid for. It was expected that you worked 50 to 60 hours a week. And if you didn't, then you were, it was commented that you're on the B team, right? And, and I mean, I was always raised with a really strong work ethic. My dad worked all the time, but he was very passionate about what he did. And so 
I've always been a bit of a workaholic, which hasn't always served me well. But I think depending on the companies you work for, there can be this expectation still in some corporations that you ha- you should work longer than the hours that are typically presented to you. And so, you know, I've also been in that position where being self-employed and I love what I do. And so I tend to put everything into work and then not as much into my relationship. So today it's really about what are my priorities in life? And for the first time ever, I actually have a family that I have to think about. And that can be hard sometimes because I love what we do. I love what I do, you know, as a side hustle as well. And so sometimes that can overtake my personal life, but it's, I enjoy spending time with my partner, with the kids. And I have to remember that sometimes. So I think for me, it's just a constant reminder of what is actually important because my partner hopefully will be there till the day that I pass away, should I be lucky enough for that. So I really have to catch myself sometimes. And you've told me stories, tomorrow about your former corporate work and really how the environment was very judgmental. You would show up before anybody else, but if you left at all early, someone would give you like the stink eye and say, what, where, where are you going? Where did that come from, that whole idea that it, it, it was more about time than quality, right? Mm-hmm, absolutely. And I think, and that was a really interesting scenario because I've always been a morning person. I like getting up early. That is shifting slightly now because I actually love spending time in the morning with my partner. But that's, I work best. You know, there's times where I've woken up at 3.30 in the morning and headed to work. Do I want to do that today? Probably not. But I think there is this, you know, with some companies in this company in particular, where if other people perceived things because maybe they came in later and stayed later, there was a lot of judgment. And I think that's just personal view, right? We all kind of, I I think we're all can get caught judging sometimes and what people do and what they don't and not recognizing that they might actually be working late. They might actually be working early in the morning. So that actually was a really strange situation that unfortunately that's a personality thing, you know, in my opinion. So, and it just obviously wasn't the right place to stay. So in the words of my mother, Grandma Susan up on the farm in Ferndale, mind your own knitting is uh, right. a common phrase. So whoever that guy was that said you weren't spending enough time at work <laughs> needs to call my mom. Libby, what about you? I'd love to hear, you've had a bunch of different work experiences in your career. But did you ever struggle with work-life balance or how did that play out for you? I really did in my first like primary job in my career. I was there for about eight years. And it when I joined the company, it was not a startup, but it very much ran with that kind of mentality and that kind of culture. So just lots of working. So, you know, people emailing at all hours and you were kind of the worst if you didn't respond. You just, you felt a lot of pressure to be like always checking. Remote work was not allowed. And it was also like, it was pretty clunky because you had to like log into your laptop through, you would log into your computer through a different laptop. It wasn't, it was just, the company was not set up really for remote work. And so, but even folks on the sales team who, you know, had a laptop who could go home, it just, it was really frowned upon. It was looked at as like, you weren't part of the team and you weren't working with everybody. You weren't actually working I think that was partially um, the culture, but partially born from a sense of like burnout that everybody felt and kind of like a, like a total feeling of jealousy. Like, why can that person work at home and I have to come in here 50 hours a week or something, you know? So there was not, I mean, my life was pretty heavily skewed towards work. Um, when I was there, you know, I started working there before I had kids before, uh, actually, no, I think I was dating my husband at the time we were dating. So, but you know, we were dating, we didn't 
live together. We didn't, weren't married and didn't have, we were young and very, could run on like little sleep. So it was very skewed towards work. And by the time I left, I was very burnt out. I had just had my first child. I tried going back to work and I just very quickly realized that I was not going to be able to like work the same way and it would not have been well received for me to change my work habits in that environment. And then I worked in a different environment that was, and also in that company, you know, if you told HR, they were going to tell the owner. So, you know, there were a lot of like culture problems in general, but it was very opposite of corporate. And then I went to a TV station that was very corporate and was kind of like, almost the opposite end of the spectrum, but it was refreshing for me because on one hand, I'd have people who were like, I only work from nine to five. I don't look at my emails afterwards. And I'd be like, that's really annoying. Like, could you just answer this one question for me? (laughs) But, you know, there were like a lot of unions involved there. And so, and a lot of more like rules they had to follow. And so it was just kind of widely accepted that, if you weren't at work, like you can't force somebody to be working. And I also worked on a team that was super flexible and really encouraged a work-life balance. And so, and my boss there was, was wonderful about that. He also had kids. So he understood what life is like when you're just trying to survive. So it was different. And my work life kind of my like work life balance kind of went back to the middle and then here it is a very you know an even more kind of a bigger focus i feel like on a work life balance just with our 4 day work weeks and encouraged time away from the office you know with our we don't really it's not really pto but ota we call it ota oscillation mm-hmm. time away with that. And then our company shuts down for four weeks out of the year. And so it has really given me the ability to like, to focus very hard on my work for four normal days. I'm not working like 12 hour days. And that's a very long explanation of saying of, of my journey, my work-life balance journey. Oh, I think there were some interesting dynamics there. I think when you start adding children into the equation, and I think especially for moms, it becomes really challenging because a kid with an earache in the morning changes your entire day. And sometimes you've got to go to the doctor, you've got to do all kinds of other activities and that schedule becomes really chaotic and managing that you really do, I think, have to have the support of an employer. Otherwise it just doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm curious, Mark, because you, you know, your sons are grown, almost grown, but with a New schedule. I some people aren't familiar with new schedules, but there's like a early early morning where you go in at like two or three in the morning, and then a the general day schedule where you're on like nine to six or something, and then an evening schedule when you're there from three to eleven or later midnight. Mm-hmm. But how did you find work-life balance as somebody who was married with kids when you either miss the mornings or miss the evenings and also like you have to sleep. So like, when do you, how did you do that? Yeah. Early in my career, when I was over in Spokane, I was a reporter at KXLY and I started in radio and then transitioned into TV. So I was reporting for TV and my news director came to me and she said, Hey, we have an opportunity for a weekend anchor position. And it was a big opportunity. And, uh, and I told this story on the contributors corner episode with Dr. James But she came to me and she said, hey, this is a great opportunity. You want to get into anchoring. Uh, We have this weekend position open. And I thought about it and came back the next day and and said, well, my wife works as a school teacher Monday through Friday. And if I take this weekend job, we're we're really not going to see each other. And I said, I I just can't take the job. And she she really was like, like shocked. Because in television, there's so much competition for these jobs. And she said, you know, this is probably going to slow your career way down if you make decisions like that. And I'm like, that's okay. 
And so about three or four months later, a morning anchor job came open at the same station. And she came back to me and she said, you know, we've got a weekday anchor position. It's yours if you want it. And, and I took that position and it, it made me realize, and when I would go back for years to Washington State University and talk to broadcasting students, I would tell that story because I said, if you don't draw the boundaries, even when you're in your 20s, those, those boundaries will get drawn by other people and you'll be bound by those. And so I said, figure out what's really important in your life and have the courage. It, it's scary to tell your boss, no, but have the courage to say no to the things that are going to impair that quality of life and the things that are important to you. So that was kind of the er my early experience kind of told me that, you know, the universe rewarded my decision to spend time with my wife. And that was really cool. But beyond that, Libby, you talked about the crazy schedules and it really is a sacrifice. You're either getting up in the middle of the night and anchoring a morning show or you're going to work mid afternoon and you're not home until midnight. And so when I look back, I realize that my wife had to do a lot of the work to get the kids off in the morning or to get the homework done in the evening and prepare dinner all by herself. And it's, you know, I get a little emotional sometimes when I think about this because I missed a lot. I missed a lot. And I'm really grateful that my wife is the amazing woman that she is, that she picked up a lot of slack and that's an industry where you just can't dictate your schedule. You either have to do a morning show or evening shows. And so there, there's a cost. But I think the flip side, it was an amazing career, an amazing experience. And I think the higher you go up the food chain in news, the more that management knows they have to respect your private time and your time away because they don't want a burned out crabby guy on the news <laughs> And so I, I think that there really was a nice balance in terms of the amount of vacation and, you know, adequate time away to spend time with family. Alon. I thought Libby had mentioned something super important about culture. And it reminded me, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine last night who works for a major tech company in the Seattle area. And we were having a conversation about how they lied to him when he applied for the job, promising him work-life balance. And so I think for us, we live in a really redeemed workspace where unlimited PTO or for us OTA really means what it says. A salary means what it says. And I think for a big reason why we're any of us are doing this is because so many of our peers and people that we know experienced incredibly unredeemed workplaces where a salary, which should mean you have the ability to work when you want to work. It means for a lot of people that you're only paid for 40 hours, but the expectation, like Tamar said, is that you work 60. Or unlimited PTO means you're going to take less PTO statistically. They know that, and they don't have to pay you out for any accrued PTO when you decide to leave. Yes. So I think there's like these cultural things that have to come along with the benefits that are provided because otherwise it feels so unredeemed that it just feels culturally normal for the companies you're applying to, to lie to you about what their benefits really are because the culture isn't there to back it up. And like on that note, the idea of the 40 hour work week isn't designed for an individual or a family living life that both people need to work. The reality of what we live in economically now is that a two income household, I mean, I live a dink lifestyle, a double income, no kids lifestyle. And it's a huge, I mean, I, I live in a redeemed, redeemed workspace and it is a huge deterrent financially, not, not to be pushing forward for kids right now because we both have to work and childcare is expensive and all these other things. And so I don't think culturally, societally, a 40 hour work week is designed for the success of people like Libby who value their career, but also value being a mom and a parent and want to have that balance for sure. So I don't think societally we're designed for that. And then the other cultural pressure is we still want to hit those milestones. I'm 30, you know, still want to have the wedding and I still wanted to buy a house and I do want to have kids. So I want to be able to do all those things. So I have to work in the 40 hour work week because that's what the culture is and the society is. And I, fortunately for me, I'm lucky enough to work somewhere where my OTA is real. My 
my salary is real. Like all of those things really mean what they say. So those were just the thoughts I was thinking as Libby was bringing up the culture of places. Cause I think that's a huge piece that we're still missing for all these companies that are offering benefits. Right. That's really insightful, Elon. And one of the things that our boss, Dan Rogers will say is if you want to know what someone believes, watch their actions. And I think the same can be said for a company. The fact that he shuts our company down for two weeks at the end of June and two weeks at the end of December, and there's no work. I mean, that's that says a lot. A four-day work week says a lot. Unlimited OTA says a lot. So I think you you can learn a lot about a company. And we just had a guest on the Beats Working podcast who who spent his life in software startups. And he talked about you know, the Candyland companies, the Googles and the, and the Microsofts and the Zillows and the Amazons. One of the reasons that tech companies provide all the goodies for their employees is they don't want them to leave the office. So they provide food, they provide snacks, they provide entertainment, ping pong tables. And I mean, that's a deliberate move on their part because they know that if they provide all that stuff, they're going to get more work. And, and that's a meat grinder in, in a lot of those industries, the big, big tech companies. And doesn't that feel inauthentic? Hmm. I mean, on the surface, on paper, it looks so incredible that you've got this ping pong table and kegs in the break room, right? But when you, you know, it, I think people really read that as being, oh, you're trying to trick me, you know? <laughs> Tamar. Well, and one of the other things I've learned over the years is that we stop becoming productive after a certain amount of time. You know, I mean, it's not uncommon for me to work 60, 70 hours a week previously thinking that if I worked more and also the employer pushing you to work more, you would get more done, but you don't, right? And I, I used to think, okay, well, if I work lots, then that, you know, my value, I'm, I'm worth more. But it's not true because you're just not productive after a certain amount of time. You're tired. You feel lethargic. You want to go home. You want to do all these other things. And I think it's important to be intentional, even if you love what you do, which has tended to be a problem for me over the last, I would say, five years, is I love what I do. I could do it all day. I mean, I could sit and create all evening if I chose to, but I need to fill my cup up so that I can actually continue to be creative, to continue to do my best work. And if I push myself too hard and then I experience burnout, usually I'm well in the burnout and it's too late. So I think there is something to be said about working, you know, a certain amount of time so that you can still remain productive and not overdoing it. So we're all in our home offices right now. And one of the things that I think is a challenge to this new structure of work where a lot of people are, are remote is that the, the line between work and, uh, and home is about 15 feet that way. And uh, I'd love to ask all of you, how do you sort of draw the lines when it comes to, okay, it's time to shut my computer off and I'm just going to focus on my spouse or my family. I'd love to know because I mean, I have to be honest, my wife and I, Jamie and I are empty nesters now, so I'm really not neglecting anyone in, in, except Jamie, in, and she's cool just kind of like chilling after she gets home from work. I'd love to explore the idea of separation between work and home now that so many of us are working from our home offices. So how do you draw those lines? How do you set the boundaries when it comes to having work and home so close in proximity. Who wants to jump in on that one? Well, I have two other bosses here at home. They are seven and three. And so <laughs> when they arrive in this office, that really is a strong <laughs> indication to transition to my other job. But, you know, it's really funny. When I was working at the magazine. And at one point, I think it was before I got pregnant. I don't know. It was kind of like in the last couple of years of when I was working there. But TJ and I rented this really cool house in Laurelhurst, like this kind of cabin, like down on the water. You had to go down 92 stairs to get to the house. So it's just a straight, giant steel staircase. I've got photos. It's dizzying. But when I would make the turn onto Mary Gates Drive, which was about, I don't know, three quarters of a mile from my house or something, 
I'd make the turn. It was like, I just got to a point, like I'd always take my computer home with me every day, always took it home with me every day, every weekend. But there was just one day where I turned that corner and I was like, I'm not going to open that computer when I get home. I'm not going to open it. And it was so weird from then on. I just couldn't. It was like, I turned that corner and my brain was like, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not working there. And I think it was truly because I was in a stage of real burnout. Now, if it was like, if I was actually going to work from home, I would work after I turned that corner, obviously. But I don't know. I think I just got to such a point of burnout that I'm just very like, uh, there's just something in my brain that's like after a certain point of the day, I'm like, you know what? I've worked a lot today. And also I don't work super great in the afternoon. I'm way better in the morning. Mm. So I'm just like, I, it's going to take me, you know, sometimes I'll try to do stuff later in the evening, but it takes me three times as long as if I just wait and get up and do it early. So I think just knowing, you know, getting more like honest about the way that my brain actually works and also about my priorities and not trying to be everything to everybody. Um, and just focus on put like as much focus as I can, like where I am at that given time has really given me the freedom to not feel guilty, but you shouldn't feel guilty about not working anymore, but it's, it really gives me a lot of like freedom to cut my work off and just go back to it the next day. Yeah. Tamar, how do you, how do you deal with the work-life balance when you're sitting there in your home office for a lot of the day? I think having kids helps. Like what Libby said, you know, we have an eight-year-old that's up and down the stairs and wants to say hello and is really excited. And I've actually, usually when other people call me out, that tends to work well for me because I am still, whether I like it or not, sometimes a people pleaser, a yes person, but I can also be that way for work. And so having my partner actually at one point call me out and say, listen, you know, you may not realize it, but the youngest loves to say hello when you get home. She wants to spend time with you before we eat dinner and before she goes to bed. And that almost broke my heart because I was like, really somebody wants to spend time with me because I, you know, have basically ruined relationships because work mattered more than a partnership, you know? And I think that's eventually it, get, it, it could get to the point where your partner is going to make that decision for you, where they feel like they're kind of on the bottom of the pile, work is on top. And that's when problems start to happen. And I think because I care so much about my, my, my partner today, it does matter, right? It does matter that, you know, I don't put work above everything else because at the end of the day, you know, they're the ones that are going to be there. They're the ones that are going to love me. And it does feel good to actually have people who want to spend time when you shut down your computer. And I have to honor that not only for them, but for myself, because it does fill up my cup. Oh, that's great. Elon, what about you? Well, at Work P2P, we use um, like a task management tool. We mentioned it a couple of times. It's called the Top Six. Mm -hmm. So before I shut down for the day when I'm working or even during the day, I will plan the most important six things that I could possibly get done for the next day. And I write my schedule down for the next day, including those top six items. And I've taken a moment to weigh those items based on their urgency and their importance and their due date and, you know, be realistic about the amount of time that those things are going to take. And then, you know, just like Libby said, making sure I've assigned those six items into places in my day that I know I'm likely to be more productive. So you generally won't see like any creative stuff on my scheduler after 3 p.m. So that's been a really empowering tool when you're we're talking about like shutting down for the day. I'm pretty confident that after reviewing the day that I planned the day before, scoring if I've done those most important six items, that score uh, tells me if I've done successful at my job that day or not, or other things that I thought were most important. 
And then I can confidently say, well, I don't need to think about tomorrow because I planned it out. It's written down and it's prioritized in the sequence that it needs to be prioritized. So I and then back to the score pieces, each one of those six items, if I do them, I give myself a score. And that kind of helps me keep track of whether or not I used the time effectively that day or whether or not I got the things done that I needed to get done. And again, that's that tool has been really empowering to me to make sure that, look, I've done the work. I don't need to feel guilty about timing. These are the projects. This is what I've produced. This is the value I've added today. So I can confidently shut my computer and walk away feeling like I did. I did the things. Elon, that's that's cool that you mentioned the top six. And, you know, part of the top six process also, there's a master list of all the things that we need to get done in our personal and professional lives. So instead of trying to carry that stuff between our ears, we put it on the master list and then we do the top six for the next day. And, you know, Dan, our boss calls it clearing the shelf. So when you shut your laptop in the evening, you've cleared the shelf, you've planned your next day, and there's really no reason to be worrying or thinking about work after that, which allows us to really show up in a better way. What I think is interesting about this discussion, especially for those of us who have kids, there's a statistic, and I'm pretty sure it's pretty accurate, but by the time our kids are 18, we will have spent 90% of the time we will ever spend with them in our lives. And I think about that, and it just speaks to 18 years just goes in a snap. And now that both my boys are out of the house it just makes me grateful the time that, that we were able to spend together because you get one shot, you get one shot of that family. And, you know, the biggest sadness that, that I see are the people who are just type A workaholics and they're never home. And then their kids are 18 and out of the house and they have no relationship with them. And, you know, that's sad because I think the, you know, the most beautiful part of life is those little ones that we bring into the world and help get on their way. Well, as we start to wrap things up, I'd love to just ask the question, what would you tell your younger self about a work-life balance? And I think in my case, I think a lot of the fear that I had in my 20s was unwarranted. I think we worry about a ton of stuff when we're young that just works itself out. And I guess I I think that work-life balance is one of those things that we worry about. And I would just say to the younger Mark, have the confidence to keep making those decisions that prioritize the things in your life that you care about. And there will be consequences sometimes. You could lose a job over this. You could get demoted. You could get passed over for promotions. But I think just having that confidence and that security knowing that wherever the chips fall, you've made a decision that you think is best for the people in your life and for yourself. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. And I just, you know, if there are young people listening to this now, grab onto that confidence and make those decisions that are good for you. And don't worry about, don't worry about the fallout because you can go to bed at night knowing that you've done your part. Who else wants to jump in? Libby, what would you tell young Libby? Um, Young Libby, I think I would probably tell her that you don't have to say yes to everything. People are still going to like you if you don't do it all. And it is healthy and normal to have boundaries in a workplace. And, you know, I think I would probably also tell her that it is a workplace. They are not your actual family. And I say that knowing that some of the people that I have worked with in my life, I mean, many of them truly value them. Great friendships. Some of them are like my actual family, but it is, it's a job. And so I can still care for these people and support them in ways that doesn't mean um, me working all the time to, you know, for a, for a company. And that doesn't mean I don't value them any less. It just means that I have other priorities like eating dinner or like just having a social life. So I think that's probably what I'd tell her. 
so many things too. I give her a lot of advice, but that's probably it. <laughs> that's awesome. Alon, how about you? I think I would tell little Alon that legacy is more than accomplishments. It's how you made people feel. And little Alon has inherent worth because she exists, not because she does anything that anyone else is proud of. And she deserves to have a career path and a job that feels fulfilling. You don't just have to show up and do it because you have to eat. It can be something that's worthwhile to you. That is so well said. Tamar. I think I would tell little Tamar that less is more. No is a very powerful word. Say it more. And that you're better than you think. You know, because I, for myself personally, I would always overdo it thinking that if I could show people that I could do more, then they would appreciate me more. And, you know, for little Tamar, it's like having, sitting in your unique abilities, knowing that you do have things that make Tamar special and that you're good at stuff and it's okay to not overdo it. You don't have to prove your worth to anybody, you know, just be yourself. So that's what I would say. Ah, that's great. And I think, you know, the overarching thought that I have as we as we wrap this up is that, you know, in our company, Work P2P is a, is a wonderful example of this, is that work isn't a win-lose proposition. That if a company wins, then the employee loses. Or if the employee wins, the company is, you know, holding the short end of the stick. I think what Dan is trying to show by the way that he structured this company and the fact that we don't have job descriptions and he just wants us to be awesome. I think what it says is that when owners of companies show up caring and valuing, you know, caring about and valuing their employees and creating a structure that allows them to grow and flourish and develop, everybody wins, you know, and I, I feel like the one thing that I hope my boys learn as they, as they get out into the world now is that, you should be really proud of the work that you do and you should be proud of the company you work for if it's a company so that when you go home at night, you can feel good. And at the end of your career, you can feel proud that you did something that made a difference in the world. And you can feel proud that you worked in a way that made you a better person. And I think that's the benchmark as I really look at what we're trying to do at Work P2P. And that is show that the real value of work is to make us better human beings and to make the world a better place at the same time. So I feel like I feel like we're on the right track. A lot of wisdom. Alon, I'm always I'm always <laughs> surprised. I did not have half the wisdom <laughs> that you do and uh, I'm twice your age. So uh keep you're on the right track. So keep it up. Thanks, and Libby, Tamar, you guys are awesome to work with. I love being on the team. So thanks again for another edition of Sidekick Sessions. I'm Mark Wright. Thanks for listening to Beats Working, part of the Work P2P family. New episodes drop every Monday. If you've enjoyed the conversation, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Special thanks to show producer Tamar Medford. In the coming weeks, you'll hear from our Contributors Corner and Sidekick Sessions. Join us next week for another episode of Beats Working, because getting paid to practice beats working to get paid. <laughs>